Good morning, Harmony Grove. Hey, glad to have you here. I was talking to someone as they were coming in, and she was saying, well, I hope me sitting here is not messing with somebody else's seat. And like, well, I think we've messed with everybody's seat. It's just the way it is right now. Um, so it is glad to have you here. Um, there are children's bulletins in the back. Um, there, we won't be doing an offering, so there are giving stations around the church if you choose to give. Um, new this week, last week we started nursery back. New this week is we're going to start junior church back. Um, so just to remind you um, how we're, how we're going to do it, at the end of singing today, you're going to see the junior church slide. So parents, kids, you don't have to move. Wait till you see the minion slide. And when you see the minion slide, you're going to come up here to the front right by this table. Um, in the past, we used to do junior church downstairs. Um, during the summer, we're going to do it upstairs in the fellowship hall. And the reason for that is we have more space, which allows us to social distance, right? The words we all hate to hear. Um, yes, you're good, Cole. So having it upstairs will allow us to spread the kids out a little bit. Um, after the service, they will come back. Though parents, they'll meet you right up here, and we're going to ask you or someone from your family to come up and sign them out. So um, we're starting that this week. Um, next Sunday, um, we're going to start back Children's Church, which is also going to take place up in the Fellowship Hall. So if you have younger kids, um, let's say potty trained but not in school, we know that age, um, that would go upstairs in the fellowship hall. And again, that, that's just because we have more space and um, we're able to social distance. So this is going to be a process, right? We didn't just get here. We're slowly trying to bring some things back. So this week, kids, you have junior church. Wait for the slide. I just said that. Next week, we're doing children's church, right? So they're going to start up there. You can drop them off the beginning of, before the service. Yes, the preschoolers. Just the preschoolers. Yes. You should be doing this. <laughs> I'll take this off. Yeah, Nellie and Carla and I have been back and forth and back and forth. We wanted to start something for the children. We decided we do have a big space up there. We talked about doing it outside, but then air conditioning. Some of us can't handle the heat. <laughs> so we decided it would be difficult for the preschoolers to leave after the singing and get them up there. So we'd like, if you have preschoolers, we don't have facilities to change diapers. That's why we're saying, please just bring your, yeah, they could go down in the nursery. Preschoolers, please bring them up there. Next week, I will be up there. The next week, it's Nellie, and then we'll see after that. But bring the preschoolers up. We'll have something separate for them. The older children will come up when singing's done. On Someone will be here, like he said, to just to bring them up. We'll bring them back. And if you have questions, you can call Nellie or I, parents or grandparents that bring your children. After two announcements, how could you possibly have questions? <laughs> so to recap, junior church, wait for the slide, go upstairs. Good? Just nod your head anyway. Hey, our last announcement is, as you look at the stage, we're pretty close to being finished. Some of you are shedding a tear. Um, we do need about, we do have about two to two and a half hours more of work. We need about 15 people. We're going to meet here Friday at 6 p.m., Greg. Friday at 6, about two to two and a half hours. Um, it is fi finishing the upper staging, and then there's some miscellaneous things. For example, those tr that forest looks great over there, but... Um, or there's actually two pews in the front um, that need to be added, so there's not this large cavern between the stage and the 
uh, or the congregation. So if you're interested, Friday, 6 p.m., about two, two and a half hours. We need about 15 able guys. And if you have any questions, you can see Greg. Nod your head again. Good. Hey, let's pray. And as we pray, the worship team will come forward and we'll begin singing. Father, we are so thankful for this day that you have given us. We rejoice. We are glad in it. Lord, this is a day you have made. Lord, we're so thankful for the expectation, the promise of what you're going to do here in this church. Lord, we ask that your spirit would come fill this place. Lord, we ask that um, you would allow all the distractions, everything in our life just to be put aside, that we may focus on the reason why we are here, to lift up the name of Jesus, to worship you. Father, to love you with all of our heart, souls, and minds. Lord, mold us and shape us to become more and more like you, Lord Jesus. God, help us to not just be hearers, but be doers, not just to collect knowledge, but to live out real life faith. Help us to love one another here, to encourage one another, to love in good deeds, to serve one another, to see your kingdom and your glory just live through each and every single one of us here at Harmony Grove. God, allow us to leave different than when we came in. Lord, allow our lights to shine. Allow us to be able to go and show and share the love of Christ. So, Father, we come just expecting great and mighty things, things we can't do on our own, things that you pour out into us, things that you do in our hearts, things in ways that you use our hands and our feet. So we, we come with open hands and an open heart, uh, wanting to hear and to know you, Father. So it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. You may, if standing is a little tough, it's okay. You don't have to stand. Um, and we're going to, as soon as pastor's ready, we will begin our worship time. Everybody look at pastor.
You know, God is so good to all of us. I mean, he holds us in his hand. One of the scriptures that has become a mantra for me is Exodus 14, 14, where it says, the Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. And as we sing these next couple of songs, it's about how he holds us in his hand and how he hides us and he takes us as his own. And so as you sing, I hope you listen to the words that you're singing, that you just don't sing by rote, but you sing from your heart.
Yeah. Your slide. You, kids, remember, you're going to come up front here. Cole ran downstairs. He's not listening. <laughs> Thank you for going to go get my son who's not listening. Remember, parents, they're going to go upstairs to the fellowship hall, and then they will um, be brought, and you can sign them out right here at the front table um, after church. But now as we trans... Cole found his way. <laughs> hey, as we begin, I'm going to invite Deb Jolly to come up and join me here. I'll give you your own microphone. Um, so... So Deb, tell us how you first came to Harmony Grove. Well, I was attending a church in Harrisburg uh, for five years, and they decided to do a church plant. So 25 of us decided to leave the main church and go to this church plant. Well, the first month was very good. Then the second month, things started to deteriorate and people started leaving. Now, there were only 25 of us, so a few started leaving, and we weren't sure what was going on. So uh, the following week when I attended church, more people did not show up. And I felt that it was because as the preacher, instead of giving us God's word, he'd give a scripture talked a couple minutes, and then told us about what his family did on vacation, what he was going to do this week. And I kept thinking on my way home that day, Lord, I'm not being fed. I said, what, what should I do? So I came home, and I prayed all week, and I felt that I really didn't want to go back again because I wasn't being fed. So the following week, I started praying and asking God, okay, I'm not sure where you want me to go, but I said, uh, I want to be back in church. Well, you know, it's in God's timing, and I kept praying, and so I kept watching pe preachers on television, and then Saturday night as I was getting ready for bed, I said, okay, Lord, I really want a church to go to, you know, a Bible-believing church, one that preaches God's word, and as I was getting ready for bed, he said, Harmony Grove Church. So I said, okay. I said, I'll give them a try. So, <laughs> so I came in Sunday morning. The first person I met was Cindy Weir. Great smile, shook my hand, welcomed me. And I said, oh, boy, this, this is nice. This is nice. Then Dave Miller came in, did the same thing. And I thought... Okay, Lord, is this where you want me to be? So I came in the first, that Sunday. The next Sunday I came again. And as you can see, You've it's all history. <laughs> How long have you been here now? Uh, well, I came the year after you. So what, like, I'm here like eight years maybe? I'm here eight and a half, so we'll go seven and seven a half. Seven and a half. Okay. Yeah, so, so I came right after. So uh, how did you start reaching out to other people in our church? Well, it all started when I hurt my back, and it was many months where I was laying flat on my back, and I got so many cards that really touched me and blessed me that people, even though I was a new, a new person here at Harmony Grove, they all thought of me. So um, at once I was able to he heal enough that I could sit up, I started ordering cards from christianbook.com, and I started sending cards out. I figured if they can bless me when I'm down and out, I'm going to start blessing others. And that started five, year, five six years ago now, and every month, uh, if, I, if I call, uh, sometimes I might call uh, the beginning of the month and then start, send a card at the end of the month. Uh, July, I'm sending out the first of the month, and I send it out to uh, anybody I hear on the prayer line that needs prayer, uh, send them a card, the assistant living. So I'm not sure if you heard this, but we're in the midst of a global pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I, I know, to, in, one laugh, thank you. <laughs> we're going we're gonna, we're gonna to acknowledge every single person. So I know you kind of stepped things up during 
uh, these past couple months. How did you reach out to people during the coronavirus season? Well, not only sending cards, that's what I started to do, but then I thought, well, you know what? I got a phone and I got the church directory and I'm just gonna start calling people. So that's what I did. Two, two people I tried to call every week or, or more than that a week. Uh, some people weren't answering their phone because they didn't know what my phone number was until I left a lot of phone messages telling them who I was, you know. But uh, I just tried to reach out. I picked two people out and went through the whole directory and just called and said, hey, how are you doing? You know, things are good. Do you need anything? So that's how it all started. So it started out as two people a month, just to clarify. At times, you were up to two people a day you were yep. calling. Sometimes, yep. Because you and I were doing the same. I, I would <laughs> call people, and oh, yeah, Deb Jolly just called me two <laughs> days ago. I can't tell you how many times I heard that in my calls as well. Yep. Um, what were some of the blessings either that you gave or you received during um, your phone calls and you, through your ministry? Well, I think the blessings are what I received when I was down and out and sick was I wanted to show that to others. And then uh, I think the biggest blessing was calling all those that are in the assisted living. I mean, there were times where I spent an hour to two hours just talking and sharing with somebody. We prayed and just wanted to let them know that yes, they, they're, they're not able to come here to Harmony Grove, but we haven't forgotten them. We still love them, we still care for them. So that was my biggest blessing of um, what they gave to me, just listening to them, you know, that, hey, somebody called me, somebody cares about me. So that's the biggest blessing I got, especially from those living in assisted living. Oh, thank you. Hey, can we give them a round of applause? <laughs> so we're, we're week three of a series, We Are Back. Um, what does it mean to be the church? And it's interesting, everything Deb just shared wasn't things that happened here on Sunday morning, but it's happened, things that happened throughout the week. Um, so our main idea, our main point this morning is that we are called to serve, not just to come in here and sit. The idea of church isn't that we come, we gather, we go home. No, 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 we have such a higher purpose. We're not a country club, we're a church. We're, we're founded on our faith through Christ, as we talked about last week, not only are we commanded to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, but you know what we're also commanded to do? To actually love one another and care for one another and reach out to one another. And sometimes it doesn't have to be the most profound, the deepest things. Sometimes as simple as a phone call or a card can have a huge blessing impact on our lives. So I want to challenge you this morning as we begin, you know, how is God calling you to serve at Harmony Grove? How is God calling you to love one another? How is God calling you to invest in each other's lives? Well, let's pray, and then we'll get into our Bible study this morning. Father, we are so thankful that you so loved us, that you sent us your Son. Lord, that you formed us, and that you know us, and Father, that you are with us. God, we're so thankful that there's people in our lives that we, when we've gone through dark valleys, when we've struggled, how they've loved us and how they've cared for us and, and how we could feel your hands and feet through the love of other people. So God, help us not to make church about us and about our preferences, but Lord, that we are called to be purposeful, to serve and to love one another. So God, we ask for your help and your grace in Jesus' name, amen. If you're not there already, I invite you to open up to 1 Peter chapter 4. I'm going to be picking up right in the middle of the chapter, verses uh, 7 through 11. If you have your Bible app, we're in the New King James Version. If um, you're using a pew Bible, page 704 at the bottom there, and then we'll flip over to 705. Verse 7 says, But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover 
a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So we're picking it up towards the end of 1 Peter, kind of in the middle of a chapter. If you would read through the preceding verses, uh, the context is that we don't live in the flesh, but we live in the spirit. We don't live the way we formerly lived before Christ. We don't live as the world lives, looking forward to the weekend, looking forward to the next trip. But we have a greater purpose, that God so loved us, he sent us his son. So when you see that first word in verse 7, it says, but, it's a contrast. But we formerly lived for the world, for ourselves. Now we live for the things of God. It says, but the end of all things is at hand. Again, this is the third week in our series. If you have an insert, we do have three points this morning. Our first point is our focus. And we focus on the things of God. But the end of all things at hand kind of seems ominous, doesn't it? A finality. And this is the truth, right? At some point, we will all breathe our last. The end of all things will be at hand. At some point, we will stand before God, and we're going to give an account for how we live our life. First week in this series, we looked at Hebrews 10. It says, not forsaking the assembly of, um, of ourselves together. Again, it, gathering in church is often a reflection of our heart. Sometimes when we're distant from church, it's a reflection that we're distant from God. That we need one another. We need one another to exhort, to encourage, especially in hard times. So much more as we see the day approaching. The day, the end, the time where we will give an account of, of how we live. Not how much we know, but, but ultimately how much we impacted each other's lives. And since we don't live as the world, we live for Christ. We understand that the end is coming. Therefore, my, ver my version says, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Now, we talk about prayer a lot in a church, right? It's how we communicate with God and God with us. How many of you would describe your prayer life as serious or watchful? Maybe not, not that you would not use those words, but be honest, how many of you would describe your prayer life as serious as in the top three adjectives. Well, what does the word serious mean? It's a serious word, is it not? The idea of being serious is, is literally be single-minded. How many of you have ever um, tried to pray, and as you're praying, all these things in your life come up? I heard a squirrel outside. You forgot that maybe the stove is on. You get up and you check the stove and you realize the stove isn't on. You start feeling your pocket vibrate and your phone's not even doing anything. And then you take your phone out and you're all of a sudden you're on Facebook. So the idea is that, you know, as we pray, realizing that someday we're going to stand before God, is that we have a focus, we have a seriousness, that our mind's not distracted, we don't have all these other voices in our mind, we can simply focus on the things of God. So be serious and watchful. This is actually a contrast to how the world goes through things. So how many of you have known people that used to be in church? And how many of you know people that, who used to be in church, when their lives are crashing around them, they come to you and they ask you to pray for them? And how many of you know these people that they go through tragedy, they go through hard times, right? Whether it be with their spouse or their job. Because let's be honest, a bad day or a bad season is just around the corner for all of us. 
right? And these people, they, they try everything and every which way to get through it on their own. They double down, they work harder, they do all these things, and then it seems like when they're out of options, you know what they do? They send you a text message, they pick you up the phone, they, they lay out their problems, and as a last resort, as a Hail Mary, they say, hey, can you pray for me? Nod your head if you've ever been on the other end of that conversation in your life. And maybe if we're being honest, sometimes we act the same way. We have a, we have a struggle, we have an issue with our spouse, our kids in the hospital, and we frantic and we worry and we go through all these other things. And then you know what's the last thing when we have no more options on our own? What do we then do? We, we then pray. But look, you know, as Christians, what should we really do? And we know this verse, right? But I'm going to go King James on you. But seek ye first. Not as your final option. Not seek ye fifth, right? Let me try one through four. And when my list is expired, then I'll go to God. What is it? It's seek ye first, right? Because we come here as a church, we're not a country club. We, we have a great Savior, do we not? That he so loves you and he forgives you. And in giving you a relationship, he doesn't forget you. He wants to walk through you even during the dark times and the deep valleys of your life. So, as we move on, again, this is going to be a little bit of a recap if you've been in our series. It says, but above all things, as the greatest priority, have, what does that word say in your Bible? Fervent love. Be honest. How many of you used the word fervent in a real sentence this week? It's not a word we use often, is it? Right? So fervent has this twofold um, meaning to it. It has this meaning of passion and consistency. So it's something we are excited about, we give our heart and our energy to, but not just for a short season, it's something that we consistently do over the long term. Let me give you an example. Over this coronavirus season, over this quarantine, some of us have gained a few pounds, right? Some of us have put on the quarantine 15. I'm not going to nod your head. I don't want you to admit it, but you, you know who you are. I, I'll put my finger at myself. So how many of you have ever done this? You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose this weight. And you start off strong, and you go out, and you buy some crazy piece of equipment. You're like, you know what? I'm going to eat better. I'm going to work. I don't have to go to the gym. I can just go to my basement. It'll be great. I'll work out. I'll get stronger. I'll get more physically fit. Some of you looking at me like I'm crazy. Maybe I'm just confessing. I don't know. So you get, all, you get the equipment, you get the workout, and the first week goes great. You're like on it seven times. You're like, I'm not going to miss a day. This is going to be great. This is amazing. And then week two comes, and you're on it three times. But you're like, hey, that's good. My, my muscles need to rest. I'll go every other week. Right? We're still doing good. We're on it three times. And then the third week you're on it once. And now when you go downstairs to change over your laundry and you need something to dry things on, this becomes your makeshift drying rack. There's a couple boxes, right? You're hanging a blanket over whatever that bar thing is. But this is how we do things, right? Sometimes we can be passionate and we can start off strong. But over time, we lacked consistency. Right? Why? Because you know, we're, we're familiar with the um, equipment. The excitement has worn off, and it just becomes another thing. So over time, attending church, sometimes you know, we have the consistency, and we know people, and we see the same people. But over time, it becomes easy to stop fervently loving one another to go out of our way, to go above and beyond, to actually care and take the steps outside of the walls of this church to really invest in people's lives. So when we see each other on Sunday morning, we catch up, we nod, we might ask a question or two, 
But often it's easy to go Sunday to Sunday without really even thinking about other people in our church. And this is the exact opposite of what we should be doing. It says, again, if you have your Bibles, look, look at that first part. It says, and above all, of most importance... You know, if we are the church, if we say we love God with all of our heart and soul and mind, we show God's love in how we care for one another. Why? Because how can we say we love God who we can't see when we're not fervently loving, you know, people here at Harmony Grove? You know, our, our church, quote unquote, family. So above all things, fervently love. The idea is, is a passion, excitement that's consistent over time. Why? Because love will, what does your word say? Does it say love condemns? No, it says love covers a multitude of sins. So I've, I'm 40 years old. Maybe I shouldn't admit that. Um, I've been married, um, this year will be 20 years. Um, I have four beautiful kids who I love. Um, and if I'm being honest, sometimes the people who I say I love the most are sometimes the people I end up hurting the most, right? Um, so even though I've been married to my wife for 20 years, I still do stupid or silly things. Guys, nod your head with me. Sometimes we do so, we still sometimes stick our foot in our mouths. These, these bundles of joy who, when they were born and I held them for the first time, were some of the happiest moments of my life can sometimes frustrate me, and I just want to pick them up and throw them out a window in my mind, just to clarify, right? <laughs> sometimes I'm, I, I'm, I'm angry when I should be gracious. Sometimes I get things wrong. And if we're honest, I think, you know, all of us sometimes get things wrong. In my life, when I know people genuinely love and care for me, it's amazing how sometimes I can overlook their faults and their flaws and their imperfections and their selfish teenage behaviors. Again, in theory, right? Um, so if we are continually, passionately loving other people here in our church, um, it's amazing how that speaks, your actions speak louder than your words. And when you know people care for you, how sometimes they can look over, look past your faults and, and deficiencies, right? You know, it's amazing when, when you know someone who loves you, like you're willing to do anything for them because they've done so much into your life. And actually, as I look out here among the congregation, and, and I see many of you, I, I, I can, you know, these stories right now are just flooding back into my mind of, of all the ways you've been gracious to me and how, um, how loving you've been to me and my family and my life. So love, what does it do? It covers a multitude of sins. Because right? look, we're going to step in it sometimes, aren't we? And we're going to mess up. And church should be, I say to people, I say to our board, look, when church is great, there's nothing like it. Because, I mean, church in theory is really simple, is it not? We love God. We all love God, right? We're all Christians. We all should love one another, right? I mean, church should be really simple. But what happens? Silly people like us and our sin and our selfishness gets in the way and we take something so simple and so beautiful and sometimes we make it so much more complex than it needs to be. But the thing that covers all of it, the thing that solves all of it, the thing that keeps us coming back is not just our love for God, but the people here who love and care for us, who have gone above and beyond in our lives and it challenges us to go above and beyond to serve, to pour out in the lives of other people. It's interesting, the order of this verse, right? So let's look at the order. So it says, above all things, have fervent love. Why? Because love covers a multitude of sins. So I think we all mess, understand we're going to mess up, right? We all understand our sinful, our selfish nature. But what comes before the sinning part? What comes first in the order? 
Starts with an L, ends in of. Help me out here. What comes first? It's the love, right? So I think the order is important, right? Because I think sometimes we all expect and want grace and forgiveness, and God freely gives it to us, but it's easy for us to freely give it to one another when the, start the L word again, help me out, love. when that love comes first, right? No, I got my clicker right here. So love will cover a multitude of sins. doesn't mean the sin doesn't happen, but it's easy to look past the offense when you first experience God's love. This is where the, the, uh, the interview, and thank you again, Deb, for just agreeing to come up here. I know it's not easy for it, but this is where I want to share with you, you know, Deb's story, because, you know, many of you have received and been blessed through, you know, cards and phone calls. You know, I've been blessed through it, because again, I, I sometimes call people and they're like, oh yeah, I've been talking to Deb, I can't tell you, oh yeah, Deb Jolly visited me, oh, Deb Jolly sent me this card, Deb Jolly, I was like, oh, you, it's like, in some ways, Deb does a much better job at this than I do, right? Um, so as a result, verse 9 kind of adds on to this phrase. So our response should be, it says, be hospitable. And I think sometimes we get the word hospitable wrong. Because the idea, when we think about hospitality, we, we think about hosting people in our house, right? Making cookies and and being Martha Stewart and, and having this perfectly decorated and laid out um, house. And the idea behind hospitality isn't the having people over, though that's part of it. It's really the generosity and how we treat one another. Right? So if you struggle with the word hospitality, you know, you can really substitute the heart of it. You know, be generous in how you love one another. One of the reasons I want to have Deb share her story is because her generosity isn't in having people over, but her generosity is how she, you know, calls people and, and how she sends cards to people and how she goes above and beyond. And when we have that, that generous nature of, you know what, Real relationships, real love with people, you know, start in these walls, but really continue outside of this church. Then we're going to start truly loving one another. So be hospitable, be generous in how you treat one another without grumbling. I'm going to give a sip of water here before I give my next illustration. Because I need you to Put on your thinking caps with me. Now, imagine either when your kids were young or, or your grandkids. Now, I got young kids, so for me it's a little easier. But imagine when your, your kids were young and your grandkids, and, and you're watching out the window, and you see the older one, the bigger one, push the younger one, and they fall down onto the ground. I'm sure you've never seen it. This is why I need you to imagine with me. Now you just kind of steal a quick glance and the one goes boom and he, and he pushes and the other one falls and you can see their feelings are hurt and your righteous anger just, just ignites within you. So you call them in and you, and you kind of figure out what's going on and you, you point to the older one and you say, you need to apologize to your younger brother or your younger sister. You need to apologize. How does that apology usually work in your house. I, I, I've seen this and I've experienced it, so I'm going to go how it works in my house. Usually it's something like this. You get a slamward head, you get an eyes look, sorry. <laughs> now how many of you, sorry for what? Sorry for pushing you on the ground. I'm so strong, must have hurt you, sorry. Right? It's the, the highest pitch, it's the most condescending thing you've ever heard in your life. Right? Nod your head if you're with me. Right? How many of you, when your, your older one apologized to your younger one, the, the younger girl just has tears coming down her eyes? Oh, I'm so moved by that, that heartfelt apology. I never knew you felt so deeply. 
No, that's not how it goes in your house either. Just, just check it. The only reason the older one's apologizing is twofold. One, they got caught. And two, they're afraid of dad. So weighing all the options, they can force themselves into apology because that's better off than, well, fill in the blank of what it is in your house, right? But there's, as adults, there's nothing more frustrating than being on the other side of an apology, of an action that you feel is forced by the, the person, the other person. Right? We've, we've all heard this, right? I'm sorry, but, and then they give all the reasons why they're not sorry. The, the apology is forced. It doesn't mean anything. So when we love, when we're generous to, another, to one another, we do so without grumbling. Right? So the hard attitude in loving and caring for one another is you can't do it because you feel like you're being forced. Right? It's not like, well, I better do it or, or pastor's going to take away my heaven points. Like, that, that doesn't work, does it? By the way, in a couple minutes, we're going to be, uh, we've, we had an ordination council for Clint yesterday, and um, we're going to be honoring Clint at the end of our message, and we uh, are going to recognize him as a pastor, and you're leaving the St. Louis. So, so Clint, congratulations. You're going to get the title of reverend, so you can actually officially write reverend because you're ordained. And what I say in my house is because you are a reverend, you can now give out heaven points. So, I mean, feel free to, feel free to use that in St. Louis, and... Uh, or you can just keep them to yourself. I, I mean, you know, you, you, you'll figure it out. But when we're loving, we, we do so with a heart, you know, as God has loved us, as God has been gracious to us, as God has forgiven us, you know, so we love one another, right? We don't do it out of obligation or guilt. We don't do it because we fear divine lightning bolts. We do it because we, we genuinely care for one another, right? And this is how we spur one another on to love and good deeds. It's, it's out of a help for our heartfelt desire as God has loved us, you know, so we love one another. So be hospitable without grumbling. Our third point, if you're following along, is how we serve. You know, as each one has received a gift, and we've received a gift, haven't we? That God so loved you, he sent his son. That whoever would believe in him, we don't have to perish, we have everlasting life. I mean, we've received the gift of forgiveness of sin. We've received the gift of God's spirit, that God doesn't just forget about us. He indwells us. He walks through those dark valleys with us. We have received the gift that God has called us something greater. God has called us to the church. And we've received a, a spiritual gift that God wants to use you as a part of the church, so he has gifted you in a way to help encourage and uplift the body. So it is each one has received a gift, and in the Bible, once you are saved, we all have received at least one spiritual gift, that we aren't called to just sit, we're called to serve, and God has supernaturally gifted us to help serve and love one another. As we have so received the gift, we, what does it say there? We minister to one another, right? We just don't keep these gifts to ourselves, but as good stewards, as actively using it, we do so... Through, for the, the manifold grace of God. The, my, word has the, my, my translation has the word manifold. Now, I'm looking around here. I, I see we have a couple car guys in the audience. Randy, you're a car guy. So when I see the word manifold, what are you thinking? You're th Correct. You're thinking of, a, of an intake manifold. You're thinking of a car engine. That sounds manly, does it? I wish, I so wish that's what it really meant. It actually has nothing to do um, with a car engine. Um, the idea is it has to literally do with a, an arrest ray of colors. 
So this is what God has done. There, let's say there's 100 people here today. God has brought 100 people into our church. 100 different, uniquely designed people. Right? We're all different. As the old kid song goes, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in the sight. So we're all different. And now we're just all different looking, right? We all have different backgrounds. We all have different life experience. We all have different talents. We all have different gifts that God has given us. And God brings all these things together to build one church. So the idea of the manifold grace of God, let me explain this idea of different colors this way. So I have a, a cell phone. Right? Some of you have cell phones. This little circle thing is the camera. Now this cell phone has what's called an 8 megapixel camera. It's actually an old cell phone. Um, today, if you were buying a new Samsung, it would have 64 megapixels. Now you might not know what that means, but we know 64 is more than 8. Now the word megapixel literally means mega would be millions and pixels would be different shades of color. So when I take a picture with my 8 megapixel camera, it actually can um, distinguish eight, diff 8 million different shades of color. That sounds impressive, doesn't it? Until you realize there's a 64 out there and that's even more impressive. But the idea of, you, of distinguishing 8 million shades of color is that it uses all that light and all that variation to then, on the screen, show a picture. And the idea of more megapixels, you have more clarity and you have more definition in your picture. You can have more detail come out. So what does God do? God looks down through his grace and all the people he's given us. And by the way, God has given us all the people we need at Harmony Grove to love him, to love one another, and to reach this local community with the grace of God. Amen? So God is, uses everything about you, how he formed you, how he's walked with you, the experiences, the talents, the gifts that he has given you, his manifold, his many shades of grace are displayed in our lives and in this church to love and encourage one another. So in that, God has given you a spiritual gift, but God has also given you talents. God has given you life experience. God has done a work of grace in your life and done a work of grace in all of our lives, not just for you, but to encourage, to lift one another up, to challenge one another, to exhort, to do all these things to show his love to one another in our church. Amen? So how does that play out in our church? So if you look at our, our last verse here, verse 12, I think it plays out in two ways. So verse 12, I'm going to reread it. Um, actually, verse 11. If anyone speaks, let him speak the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability God supplies, so that in all things may God get the glory through Jesus Christ. So God has given us gifts. So let him who speaks, speak the oracles of God. So some of the gifts and talents that God has given us allow for upfront gifts, right? Leadership gifts. One of my gifts, believe it or not, is preaching. Now you might not agree, but... But I feel the pleasure of God in my life every Sunday morning when I get up here to speak, right? It's a blessing to, to have the time to study and, and to pray and to seek out the scriptures. And I feel God using me as I preach messages, as I proclaim his word. And it's interesting, when I go on vacation and I sit out in the, the sanctuary like Clint is doing, you know, I'm often thinking like, okay, if I were up there, this is my week off, if I'm up there this week, how would I do it? And, and what would I do? Like, like I can't shut that off. That's just part of the God's gifting in my life. But if you look at a, a sports team, you know, football has one head coach, a couple of assistant coaches, but 53 players. So in life, there's many more people who are in the crowd than up front. 
So some of us have leadership gifts, and they're important, and they, they help the function of the church, but many more have what's called gifts of service. And if anyone ministers, if anyone serves, if anyone has these other gifts, let him do it with the ability which God supplies. Right? So sometimes what we do in our life is we go, well, I wish I had that gift. Right? I, I, wish, I, could, I wish I could preach, or I, I wish I had the gift to, to the hospitality, or I wish I could do this, or I wish I was better on cars, or I keep wishing I had, had other things instead of saying, God, this is how you've made me. Let me lean into the gifts and the talents and the experiences that you have blessed me with in my life. So it isn't so much about the gift, but rather the God who supplies the gift. Remember when I was a kid, there was a Rite Aid up the, the street from where I lived, probably 150 yards. And when I got to be about 10, 11, and 12, my dad would often send his gopher up to the store you know, to pick up a few things. And one of the things my dad would do, and this frustrated me, he would say, okay, I want you to go get these three, these three things. And you'd say, well, one costs $1.99, and, and one costs $2.49, and one costs three and a quarter. And he would add it up and, and do the sales tax. And to the penny, he would give me the exact change. So I would go and, and pick up the three items. And I was always so nervous. Later, I learned to just bring along another dollar myself, but I was always so nervous because what happens if my dad guessed wrong, right? What happens if this item isn't really on sale? So, you know, it would ring up, and I would have, like, $5.63 in my pocket, and he would give me a five, and then he'd give me, like, $2 and quarters, and then he would give, like, like he was, like, like just emptying out his coin bin, and I'd have this big wad of like, change in my pocket, and, you know, but it always made me so nervous, because my dad would only literally supply me the $6.37 it exactly was. It was frustrating. This word means the exact opposite, right? Because it says, if anyone ministers, let him do with the, the ability which God supplies. And God isn't supplying with this exact change mentality. No, no, no. God, the God of the universe, the creators of heavens and earth, lavishly overflows us with his love and his grace so that we can't just do the bare minimum, that we can go above and beyond to show the grace of God to one another. Why? Because when we love one another, we receive blessings, but ultimately our heart, if we're going to do this right without grumbling and complaining, our heart in this is that we do so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. So when we come in church, it isn't about me or about the singers. You know, we, we want to try to make sure much the name of Jesus, right? We want to love him, and as we love others, we do so as an uh, act of service to our love for God. So we're back. We're not just here to sit, but we're here to serve. We're here to love one another. And as God has blessed you and has gifted you and has worked in your life, so you don't have to serve, but you get the opportunity to serve and to care for and to bless and to love one another. To whom be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And ever and ever. So the purpose of our gifts is to glorify God. So people, when they see you showing love, being the hands and feet of Christ, it isn't about making you great, but it's about pointing people Back to God the Father. Hey, as we close, we're going to ask ourselves a few questions. So do you know your spiritual gift? We talked about how God has gifted you. And one of the things God has, did, has done, and we didn't really go through the list of what they are, but God has supernaturally given you a gift which our church needs. Like, well, Pastor, I don't know our, my gift. Well, um, maybe this week you want to do some reading on it. And, you know, part of the way you do this is 
through prayer and through trial and error. But as God blesses you and blesses you in the lives of other people, this may be the area where God has begun to gift you. Second, how has God called you to serve in our church? Now, some of the service in our church is in formal ways, right? I serve on worship team. That's a, it's a formal setting. Deb, I, I meant to ask you this. Usually when I introduce people, I guess with the kids I got distracted. Usually when I introduce people, it's funny. Like I, I'll do an interview with Greg and I'll say, hey, Greg is one of our, our elders. Or, or Mim, you'd come up and I'd say, Mim, you are our Sunday school superintendent and you, you help out with the kids. I'm not sure you have official way you, like you don't have a, a title, right? You're not like superintendent of this, what? You know, I mean, you, you help out in a lot of ways, but I, I was thinking like, how should I introduce her? You're like, like this is our, I'm not sure what your title would be, but there's a lot of things we can do to serve and love one another where we don't need a title, right? You don't need a title to call two people a week. You don't need a title to, to send cards to one another. You don't need a title to have someone over your house, right? So maybe the, the, the greatest blessing is, like, again, I, I was thinking this morning, well, how should I introduce her? And I, I just said, hey, there's Deb Jolly. But I was like, you don't really have a, you do all those things of service, but you don't have, like, an, offic- like an official role. Sister in Christ, right, Deb Jolly? <laughs> Thank you. And three, you know, who can you show the love of Christ to this week? Oops. Three is so important, it has two periods, I see. Um, yeah, it does, doesn't it? But, so, you know, before you leave, you're going to converse with some people. But I think relationships start here and grow outside of the church. Right? As God has blessed you, you know, as you look around, who can you bless, who can you serve, who can you show the love of God to this week? Hey, Father, we thank you so much for the manifold grace of God in our life, how you've loved us and you've forgiven us through the cross, how you do and work and and shape and mold us. God, as you move in our life, so we ask that, um, not because we feel like we have to, but God, give us opportunities to be your hands and feet. God, give us opportunities um, to to show the love of God. Give us opportunities to to serve and that we're just not called here to sit, but to, to show your love in the lives of others. So we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand up and sing. As you're singing, um, after our song, we're going to pray over Clint in April. So if you are an elder or you were on the council yesterday, I'm going to ask you to come up to the front row here and then we're going to do something special before we end. So stand and sing, and as we sing, if you need to move, join us down front. Usually we'd have you like stand for a final prayer, but we'd have you sit down because this is going to take a minute or two. So relax. Um, Clint, why don't you come here and, and then why don't we 
and April, of course. Sorry. I'm going to turn this over to our chairman, Dave Gable. Okay. Yesterday morning, we spent about three hours with Clint and the ordination of him. He did an excellent job, and it was our pleasure to unanimously approve him as uh, ordained. And as uh, you realize, he'll be leaving us, I think, Tuesday to go to St. Louis, and you've already prayed for him. So just asking you to continue to uh, pray for him and his ministry. And if you ever visit St. Louis, he'll take you out to lunch. He said that yesterday. <laughs> so um, the council was Ron, Gary, Ray, Scott and I, and of course, Pastor, and some of the elders up here as well. So what we're going to do is I'm going to ask Ray, and then, um, then I'll pray and ask Pastor to close and anything. Now, you want to say something first? Swing your shirt. That's what you're doing. Yes, sir. Sure. Uh, First of all, thank you all for uh, being a, a part of our life for the last couple of years, and uh, this is great. I mean, we get to leave on such a high note of you guys sending us out to uh, St. Louis, so your your ministry here extended all the way out to into the West, so uh, thank you very much. So you've been a great uh, encouragement to our family, and we've enjoyed serving here, and we're going to miss you guys, so thank you very much for everything you've done in our lives. Um, we're going to St. Louis, Missouri. I'm the pastor of New Beginnings Bible Church. So, um, again, if you're ever in St. Louis, come on by. It's uh, not deep in the city, but we're nevertheless in an urban area. So, uh, a lot of people there need Christ. So, we're looking forward to working hard with the church there to reach people for Jesus Christ. So, thank you very much. All right, thank you. And uh, afterwards, I'm sure you'll want to greet them. It's up to you if you shake hands. I'm not going to say, okay. I know with, it's awkward and all that, so, uh, but make sure you greet them and share with them. So, men, if you want to just gather around a little bit, if you feel comfortable uh, laying hands on him, we're going to start with Ray, if you will. Okay. <coughs> Our Heavenly Father. What a wonderful privilege we had to sit in and hear the testimony of our brother, Clint. And, and Lord, we're just looking to you now as we know there's many uh, small things and big things that uh, will face them until they get to uh, out there where they are going. And Lord, we're asking you now that as we send them out that the wonderful privilege we had and just to hear that uh, unfolding all that God has done for them and to bring them to this place in their life where he could be ordained and send them to this church that would uh, uplift the word of God and the spirit of God and moving in the hearts of men and women that need Jesus. And so, Lord, our hearts have we're blessed to hear all of that that was in the uh, in that was written down of what he had to uh, show us that he was worthy of of handling the word of God and worthy of his life and of the family's life and the and his wife, Lord, and this is why we can stand here this morning and with much praise in our hearts of a man who is a man of God who loves you with all his heart and and looking at a, a, a city that where you have put put them that they may take the word of God and help them to magnify that name Jesus and to see